Athletic Kelly House and our program of Sunday afternoon with every fourth Sunday of the month between April and October we give a presentation of something of interest that relates to the historical side of Mendocino and the area and we are very delighted today to have Tom Thompson with us and uh, he is uh, an architect and a professor and he knows all the secrets behind why we look the way we look so this is going to be very exciting and uh, yes I think in the little uh, write-up it mentioned something about the dormers on the house and according to how many dormers you have on the house you can tell how many people live in the house and children. really how many children yes, yes how many children stuffed up in the attic maybe <laughs> but anyway about the Kelly House Museum we are a nonprofit volunteer organization we have an executive director and an archivist Carolyn and we depend heavily on volunteers to keep the museum open. So I am in hopes that among you, somebody might come forward to become a docent. We are looking for new docents, and it's a really fun experience to welcome the visitors and show them around the house and tell them a few stories about the area and the Kelly family and uh, try to answer questions or make up a story if you don't know. <laughs> we wouldn't do that. But <laughs> I don't do that very often. <laughs> but anyway, getting back to Tom Thompson, um, we're just delighted to have you here and well, I'll, you. I'll let you start. Okay, right well, just to reinforce how uh, flattered I am, I, I really found it to be an important thing that you asked me and I, I want to thank you. <laughs> I'd also like to thank um, the executive director, S. W. Yoken, uh, Carolyn Zeitner, uh, Kathy Taja, Judy Chapman, and uh, Martin Sis Simpson, aka Mr. Williams, who I uh, took a wonderful tour of the uh, village. I thought I'd, you know, see what it was about after having been in and out of, of uh, Mendocino since 1965, and then just recently, uh, three or four years ago, having built a house. So. Uh, but I think special thanks needs to go to my wife Mary Ann and my son Sean who helped me organize this. I mean, I, you know, they allowed me to do it. Uh, so what, what uh, this is Mendocino, so what we'll do is we'll take a little walking tour. And I have a few stories, a few slides that you may or may not have seen, some of you have seen, but, but let's see what, what happens. So 1972 was kind of a one of the many seminal uh, moments in, in uh, Mendocino history in the sense that they started enforcing zoning, they put uh, 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 rules about what kind of areas, what kind of things could happen in what area, and we'll, we'll hit that at the end as kind of a summary of the state of the uh, place. Uh, as you well know, the um, Pomo Indians lived in their uh, stave uh, cabins, their save huts, and it was even thought that uh, Caston, when he came, lived in in a in a stay in uh, with the Indians and then built this uh, cabin. Now this is there are three different types of log cabins. One is sort of the Lincoln log cabin where everything is is closely fit and pieces to, uh, do this and you don't need much chinking between the uh, between the logs. Then there's this which is you know, not a beautiful example, but there. And then the third kind of, of uh, log cabin is, uh, is the post and tear, which is the uh, French-Canadian kind of log cabin where the, where the uh, logs are actually set in the earth. And if you ever go through uh, Missouri, there's a town called St. Genevieve that has a, a, a large selection of, of those that are both a combination of the French uh, post and tear and the New Orleans big porches and, and it's quite a quite an interesting city if you're uh, a, a town again. So anyhow, Casson moved from that place to this which is the uh, sort of the fee that uh, he was paid for um, uh, giving the land to uh, the developers, Heezer and, and uh, those guys. Um, 
And I, and I really want to thank Marty for a lot of the information I'm, I'm giving you here. So this is the, this is the uh, village in uh, 1862. And you can see, we'll, we'll look at this part of the street as an 1868 picture. But you can see how everything has a pitched roof until you get down to one, one uh, building over in, oops, yeah, I guess this doesn't show up, but there's a couple of buildings over, the one just behind the water tower has a flat roof, but everything has this pitched roof, and we'll get into that in a moment. So then we come to uh, this map. No, we don't come to this map, we come to this map over here, which is a map of 18, uh, 68, it's a composite made by um, Heiser to, to get straight who owned what. Because they were having problems of figuring out who owned what piece of property. And so you can, so the streets are Main, then there's Heiser, there's Ukiah, there's a hint of Albion right in here. There's another, there's Albion Place, which is kind of a little courtyard among a bunch of things. And then there's Ukiah, and Ukiah moves along there. This seems to be, this seems to be where Lansing is. But Lansing actually is, per, is perpendicular to uh, this, so there must have been some other kind of maneuvering of property lines. Now, what's, what's curious about this map is that uh, there's a, chi a Chinese name here. There's a uh, there's another Chinese name somewhere in here, and those one of the things that's that's that quite interested me is that in reading that wonderful book, the Chinese in Mendocino, it said that there were a, a, between in the beginning there were about 200 Chinese. And toward the, the 20s and 30s, there were about five to 700 Chinese. And in looking at this map, which is the, um, a map from uh, the book that uh, Pearlie Maxwell wrote, this area kind of over in here, be, well, I guess actually in here, became the Chinese sector. And we'll go into that a little bit further. But this map is quite interesting because it shows a racetrack, the lumber, lumber yard, a big flagpole, must have been a symbol for this is Mendocino, uh, a bolt rack, the first mill was down here, there's a um, movable sandbar and then the, a ferry crossing and then a bridge. And this is, I think, the, the route of Highway 1 now. So we'll, um, and also during this time, there's a, a uh, piece of property over here that a Dr. Andrews owned. And Cornelia Andrews was his wife. They had moved here from uh, Gardner, Massachusetts, which is just outside of Salem. They were kind of homesick. But they came here in the, eight, in the 1862 or so. And in uh, 1865, she said, our town is getting larger. There have been three new stores built since we came and a blacksmith shop. There's another new store just completing a dwelling house going up two or three miles up the coast and so on. But she talks about spending a lot of time in Albion, which is probably one of the reasons why Albion has, has become a street name. Then later in 1865, she talks about her house. And she said that the, our house is going on finally. And the present prospect is that we shall be in it soon. There is to be a kitchen, bedroom, buttery, closet, fitting room, and office on the first floor with shed and stable attached. <coughs> also a good chamber or two, or three small ones. So there'll be three outhouses. Um, the, uh, I forgot to say, uh, that the pump is in the kitchen. I think it's being very well built for this place. The rooms are boarded all over with match boards and painted and so on. So uh, I also, and then she talks about, I, also, I think also a dozen chairs came uh, with a cane seat 
for a dollar fifty. <laughs> the wood seat was a dollar. We have a homemade table of redwood that's about as hard as any wood about here. Going, uh, going, they're going to carpet the uh, parlor with a straw carpet and uh, so on. And then she goes on to talk about the size of it, which is 20 by 25. So she's getting all of those rooms in 20 by 20, in 25 by 25. She said the lumber, on, uh, in, again, later on 1865, she said the lumbers arrive, the water runs in a pipe into a hogshead <coughs> set in the ground, and as soon as the carpenters get sober, uh, they shall start work. There's been no great news transpired of any importance. So, so be. And then, uh, she talks about the car, about the furniture, a wet sink with a pump, a bedroom, and so on. And she actually references the inside to her mother's house, her house in Salem, and her mother's house. Now, this information is I have uh, the references, and it all comes from the Kelly House uh, magazines. Now, at this time, in 1870. Uh, the population of Mendocino was 473 people. In, and this comes from a thesis that a woman did in 1948. So you know the data's antique and probably good. Uh, so then in 1890, the population was considered 806. And it's the, the listings for the population are in the Big River um, uh, uh, census tract, so that includes Albion, Mendocino, Casper, Little River, and Navarro, and those two uh, population figures are the only ones for Mendocino specifically, but um, then in 1900, the population of that census tract was about 2,347, so you might say it's, there's, the city's probably about 1,800 <coughs> or so. And then in 1910, it got to 3,500, the census tract, then in 1920 it was 31, in 1930 it was 19, uh, 1989 people, which really says the uh, depression hit hard in this area, which we know. And then in 1940 it was 2066. So the um, uh, movement, now the other interesting thing about um, the way that Mendocino developed is the um, are the street names. Now, as you see here, um, <coughs> this is the original. This is this map in here. This is more or less, uh, this is more or less where Caston's cabin, original cabin was. But you can see here's the Catholic cemetery, here's the Catholic church, the athletic fields where the <laughs> high school is, the Evergreen Cemetery. And then this is uh, Portuguese Flats, and it's undeveloped. This was Heezer's uh, dairy farm back in here. And so then Fury Town is up in here, which I've been told had a, has a, um, had a reputation for being uh, filled with uh, people from Finland. And uh, they were, I guess, a rather uh, noisy group. <laughs> they uh, apparently, according to... Uh, Katie, they love to get together, sing, dance, do all this sort of thing, and that was uh, the area that they did it in. And uh, so they had a great time. Now, the other thing that's interesting to me is the source of the names of the streets. For instance, uh, Cato, they, <coughs> there's some literature that says it's an aberration of Catholic. But it turns out it isn't. That the Cato... Cato was a little village up by Laytonville. Had a general store, a, a, a stable, and a couple of other small buildings. <coughs> but, it was, but it's also the name of an Indian tribe. The Cato Indians, a very, very big time <coughs> tribe. It also turns out that um, I couldn't find much on Covalo, except that that's where the uh, Indians from Fort Bragg were moved to, to their reservation or rancheria. <coughs> Then Calpella is a, another Indian name, and it was named after K. 
K-A-L-P-E-L-A, who is the chief <laughs> of the Northern Pomos. So uh, we get that. And then uh, Ukiah is also the, um, is, it's not named after <coughs> Native Americans, but it's named um, after the Ukiah Grant, which was the um, uh, Spanish land grant given to uh, that area in the 1840s or 50s, whatever it might have been. And uh, also, the, Na the Native Americans from the Noyo River were apparently moved there. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but I got this out of uh, American Archaeology and Ethnicity from, uh, by uh, A. I. Krober, who was a, a, you know, a big time guy around then. So then we move on, and so we move on to this, which is the eight, which is the picture that matches this thing. This is 1868. And again, you notice these, and this is that building with the shed on it. Now, I was told that this is a coffee house slash bar. And typically, as, is, as was the case with Dix, that's downtown. Apparently, the, peop the store owners lived above or behind the, the uh, buildings. So this would have been a restaurant. This is, looks suspiciously like another bar. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then this flat roof building that we talked about before and on down Main Street. Now, the Andrews house would have been down, down toward the end of uh, Main Street. <coughs> so what goes on here? is what we want to browse. Um, the, next, the next one would be uh, Banker's Row, where you can see um, the four houses, excluding Blair House. Now one of the, and so Blair House was built in 1888. So one of the interesting things about Blair House, and I don't know about the other mansions along there. Um, this will come up in a minute. Um, but Blair House is, is, was heated originally by coal. And so the rooms are, there's a, the, the plan is a long corridor, and then these, these contained rooms, these lock, you know, these closed off rooms, the parlor and the, and the um, receiving room have a big double door, but they're, but the, but, so coal was the source of heat and coal shaped the building, which is kind of an interesting phenomenon. So the question was, uh, where did the coal come from? Was it brought in by ship? Was it brought in by car, uh, by a you know, wagon and so on? Who knows? Well, that's one question. That, and as I did this, I found all kinds of questions like that, what happens. So then on um, Bankers Row, there's also the Preston House where, um, which is, I can pass this around. I guess that's the best I can do, which is the house that was burned down and the uh, art center is there. And it was quite a, it was actually the most mag magnificent of the five or six places. Mm -hmm. Now the other thing about the Blair House is apparently J.B. Johnson, who was a, uh, a, a developer, a builder, designed these buildings, as well as an undertaker and a casket maker. So it, the tradition of, of people in Mendocino having two jobs kind of continues. I mean, you, you know, our contractor is a singer and a contractor. Another, our floor man was a drummer and a floor guy. You know, so that this kind of thing continues through time. But the but um, if you look at the Blair House, the uh, Presbyterian Church, the house down on Calpella, the Victorian House, and there's a house on uh, Evergreen, they all have the same detailing for the battens. In other words, the battens are, are a heavy piece, but the edges are trimmed back, or they're beveled back. And they're all four, there's four or five of them around. But that's a sign that the guy, Johnson, developed those, built those houses because he used the same kind of details. And um, it'd be interesting to see what his background, who this guy was. You know, I don't know whether there's any information on him or not, but uh, uh, who this guy was would be kind of an interesting question. Now, the next slide <laughs> uh, talks about Lansing 
and we'll catch up with these things as we go along. And Lansing in um, 1906 was it was the kind of main street. I don't was it Highway One no. at that time? Yes, it was. Okay, so so it was Highway One and um, was quite a quite a major. <coughs> Uh, street, a big wide street. It was uh, must have been 60 feet wide, and the um, the Kelly store. There's a carriage house. Uh, there's the place where uh, Moe's Coffee is. That was a, a uh, I don't think it was a stable. I think it was a blacksmith shop and so on. And then there was a stable next door to it. So that's and then in the in the in the background. I think that one of the things that's interesting is that as you enter on Lansing, you see the Presbyterian Church. As you turn up Lansing and go up the hill, there's the Catholic churches. Not that this was a very religious community, <laughs> but you know those are kind of heavy-duty symbolic pieces in the um, in the in the planning of the town, and. Uh, uh, one of the things that I tried to do, which is totally bad news, was, um, let's flip through here, okay. Okay, there's Casson, we've been there. There's Casson again, there's Main Street, there's our map, woo! There's Main, uh, Main Street again. Okay, now this is the one that shows the three major houses with the seminary in the background. And um, it, so the, the water tower became an art form, clearly. I mean, there's that beautiful book, The Water Towers in Mendocino, that shows the water towers. This is the, the uh, Hewitt House. You can see it was really elaborate. You know, it was probably the most elaborate of the of the five or six on the street. And then we get to uh, again looking at at uh, the Bankers Row with the high school. This is 1888, and then the Catholic Church in the background with the. And by this time, the um, uh, Blair House had been built. And one of the interesting things about the Blair House, not only is the facade uh, is the facade and the east side unchanged, but the barns in the back are unchanged. And those are all post and beam barns. So, and, and they're, uh, you can rent them the high school. Uh, and again, you can see the, the art form in the water tower. Uh, this is this, the picture of Lansing that I was talking about with, here's a part of the, um, where Moe's is, there's the, the uh, Masonic Hall, the Catholic Church, and this uh, is Kelly's Mercantile Center. Then we get to St. Vincent's, which was actually off of uh, Little Lake, which was um, right here, and then, um, and that was torn down in 1921, and apparently for no other reason than it was, it was a good building at that time, as, as from what I can determine. And then this is the seminary and uh, St. Anthony's with their water tower. And this burned down in 1930, it was built in 1906. And unfortunately, all the records of the Catholic Church were, were gone. But one of the things, there's, this, there's a book, one of the uh, review publications talks about that the normal population of Mendocino was about 700 during the summertime. And many of those families went out and camped in the woods. During the winter time, when it was too muddy to work, the population was about 5,000. Which, in that little community, 5,000 people meant a lot of people. So, we'll look at, so, um, one of the things that they did was they, they found ways to, to accommodate that. Uh, those 5,000 people, this isn't one of them, this was the uh, barn that um, was the parish barn. It was the parish hall at one time, but it was torn down in about 19, well, when they built Matheson Hall. It's kind of a shame because it's a neat old building and there was, there was um, a lot happened in there. So then you get uh, Little Lake with the uh, Grendel house and the, 
and this one was whose name I can't remember. And um, then we come to this area over in here. And this is the Escola House. And I noticed that uh, there's a tribute here to Nanny Flood Escola, who was quite a, quite a uh, historian. And they, and, and so she owned this, but yet in um, 1984, I believe it was, the, uh, or 85, the new owners, the Averys, decided that there wasn't enough space in the house. So they raised it. Not raising it in the sense of tearing it down, but raising it in the sense of making it a two-story building. So, um, so that's that's kind of a unique. That's I don't know other instances where that occurred, but that's a very interesting kind of piece about this. You know this. Now the other thing that's kind of interesting is you'll you'll see that there were a lot of buildings moved around. And um, we'll show you one. I'll show you that. somewhere in here. There's one. You know, they they just took my foundation on my house. They just did that with the cribs, like that house. Uh huh. Yeah, exactly the same. Yeah, yeah. The house. Uh, there's a house on uh, Covalo that again they raised about eight feet, put a foundation, and then lowered it. And it, you know, it's an, it, amazing how they can do that. But they've been moving houses for ages. So this is, this is a house on the corner of uh, Lansing and uh, Covalo. And what's interesting about this, remember Dr. An uh, Cornelia Andrews spoke of her house being 20 by 25. Well, this house is 20 by 25. Wow. Has a second story. And this is the house, um, you can see that there's a, uh, sort of hints of a, of a porch back here. There's a chimney that goes to something back there. There's the other chimney. And it had a porch. So the, the and this house was built in uh, by a Dr. Higgins, Mr. Higgins, who was the um, principal of the Ukiah Public Schools. And it was built in um, 18, uh, 1881. So, subsequently, this house uh, had a room added, another room added, in the, which may or may not have been there when, the original, when that other photo was, but, and the porch was altered, and the fence along uh, Lansing with these steps. And then a curious thing happened. The people that murder she wrote thought this was one of the neatest houses that they did. So they did an episode. And what they did was to change the front of the house, whoops, change the front of the house to this. And uh, then you can see um, the characters in uh, Murder, She Wrote. Uh, I keep saying Jessica Tandy, but that's not right. Um, uh, there, Sally Howell, who lives, lived in the house at the time, and um, Margot Farrar and another woman are standing here and they're taking a body out of the house. <laughs> so this, so it, um, it has, a, has kind of multiple histories. The school t teacher built it. And the other thing that they said about this is that everybody who lived in the house added something to it. So it has, it has a kind of a very, and that's one of the things that I find is quite, <coughs> whoops, that I find is quite fascinating. Uh, and this is it today. So the, this box is the original 20, 20 by uh, 25 figure. Then you have this edition that was sometime after 1913. And then all of these editions, little editions and things were added to it and so on. It doesn't talk about how many, uh, chambers it had, but it it uh, uh, speaks of of uh, and, and when it was taken apart, you could actually see the different pieces that were put in it. Now, one of the other things that's curious about Mendocino is that it has, over time, different styles of architecture have been introduced. So this is what's called a mid-century modern home, 
And mid-century modern homes kind of began with Eichler in the Bay Area and all over the country, Charles Eames with the furniture. It was kind of post-war sort of thing. So there's this house, then there's another house um, that's on uh, Calpella that is just, I call it the hedge house. Behind that hedge is a mid-century modern house. You can actually, from uh, the corner of um, Lansing and, and Covalo, you can actually see the skylights, which is one of the characteristics, the bubble skylights, which is one of the characteristics of mid-century modern homes. So this is the art center, which was put in the place of the um, Hewlett House. But what's interesting about this is that it's not only, it was uh, built in 52, but it's an example of the uh, Bay, kind of Bay Area modern uh, William Worcester sort of ranch style home or uh, building where it's low and it has lots of glass and it has uh, these, you can't see them and you wouldn't know what I was talking about, but anyhow, they have some beautiful hope window, do hope doors, which are these metal doors that were ju are just fabulous doors. They were used in the East and so on. And then there's the, the Zaka house, and Zaka was the guy who founded the Art Center. So this is another case of the uh, Bay Area modern, kind of mid-century modern sort of thing. There's, there's uh, another house, the uh, Hannah Lee Reeves house is like this. There's another, there's a garage on, on um, down on Calpella and Heaser, I think it is, that's a mid-century modern garage. In other words, a big, long, sloping roof and that sort of thing. So there's four or five of these places here. Was that whole, was that whole uh, building the Zaka house? This was Zaka's home, yes. Yeah, yeah he had a, sh there was uh -huh. stores below and, and he lived above. <laughs> then this house, is an exam is you know everybody says what is that house doing there, but it's actually a house a Levittown house, <laughs> and Levittown was the first major subdivision in the fifties in New York and Long and uh, in New York and and uh, that area, and you know there there's a whole variety a number of versions of this but this is this and this are about the same thing. So there's some, a reason to appreciate that house. This is a true implant from the East. Um, is there any odd porch top above the front door there? That's it's a very odd shape in the next picture. Okay. No, no, that one back. Sorry, back one. Okay, now look how weird that porch is. The porch top. Well, the door. I don't. They may well have put this porch on, and because it's pretty wet and fog. Yeah. I, I don't know, but but there are versions of those houses that have the Where? the basic house is the Levittown house. Where is that house? It's on the corner of Ford and Little Lake. Now, this may have been. Uh, built in the East and transported. I don't know whether they sold the plants or not or whether they just copied it, but in any case. And what year was that built? Do you know? It was about, I, I don't know, probably around 56. Okay. Um, I, now this house is a, is a beautiful example of the simple kind of building that was built here in the sense that it's two by fours, Two by six rafters, a two by six roof rafters, and a two by six floor. And it's just, and this is the one thing that really, uh, that I think is so magnificent about Mendocino. You have the Baker's Row, you have all of these places, but the proportions and the simplicity and the uh, elegance of construction of these places is so beautiful. And you have, this is a kind of, uh, a, a smaller example, and then you have the Packard House as a larger example of the same thing. So it's the same building puffed up a little bit. But again, this is the kind of thing that, that builders did. They had these patterns that they would build. And uh, I don't know whether the same builder built this, but for instance, this siding is the same as this siding, but this siding is pretty common all over Mendocino. So. Um, you have a dormer up there. Uh, now this is an interesting site, and this was uh, pointed out to me by uh, 
aka Mr. Williams, that the um, Headlands Inn used to be here. And this is the Headlands Inn. So you can see why it's so narrow. And I think the year that they moved it was? It was in the 90s, I think 94, but I'm not sure. So, and this, this building, which is the gallery uh, bookstore, that building, and these two existed and sort of, you know, really squeezed it in. So they moved it to over here. And they developed it further. Now this is an interesting site because this is, this is the, as, as I understand it, this is the old, um, in the, you know, over in, over in here, this is the uh, old Chinese store. And there, was, there were a, a succession of families that owned it. And I think in 1909 or 1916, the last uh, Chinese family owned it. And the, uh, the temple, I tried to get the temple in, the temple's right over here. And, is, and so, uh, so there were little shacks that the Chinese lived in. Now there were also little shacks that everybody else lived in who were the, among these 5,000. Who, you know, the, among the, the, peop the people who came out of the woods and lived, and lived in these little shacks that, that were probably 10 by 12 or, you know, 8 by 12. Just the minimalist things. And apparently they lived in the city, they, uh, in the town. They, um, you know, frequented the, the restaurants and they had barbecues and they had a, a whole society or a whole thing going on in amongst these little buildings, and it was both the Chinese and the um, other, the Portuguese. And these are the kinds of shacks that they had. This happens to be at at, uh, at a um, mill up on on uh, somewhere up there. But anyhow, it's not it's not the the uh, Big River Mill. It's one of the other ones. But this is the typical kind of house. And so they built these all over. People, that's how pe one way that people made money is they would build these little shacks and then rent them out. Which is also one of the sort of really fascinating things if you look at um, the uh, history of Mendocino, that you had all of these people coming into San Francisco, the Portuguese, the Irish, the Italians, the Chinese, and they try the gold fields or the gold fields aren't so good anymore. And so they come, one of the places they come are to the lumber yard fields. And there are innumerable stories here of people working like crazy, getting money, buying property, buying ranches, and you know, going from there, just through hard work and, and tough grits. Now this is, this is a, a, a watercolor of the last house on the north side of Little Lake. And the, the watercolor is dated 1986, and I guess that's the case. But so many places up until the 70s and so on, uh, from the 1930s to the 70s, when Mendocino was, apparent, was essentially deserted. Nobody took care of properties, the paint all fell off. I mean, it looked pretty scruffy. This is one of those houses that looks scruffy. That's, that is it now. You know, a real come from behind kind of story. Now, this is an interesting, I, I find this street, this is Calpella looking up to Heiser. And this house is, is an interesting one. There's also an interesting one here. This has some fun to it, and the Ray Rice house is up there. Now, this is the Ray Rice house. Now, there's some, the, the write-up in here, in the, in the archives, says that these are Chinese shacks. Mr. He, who was, um, says here, uh, Rice's were told by George He, an old-time resident, that the, um, House was constructed by moving three Chinese bunkhouses to the site. Mm -hmm. Now, some have said that it's the they're the bunkhouses from the Little River, from the Big River Mill. But who's to dispute Mr. He since he's gone? You know. Um, so anyhow, so that's one thing. Now, 
This is another house. This is the uh, Salvador Silva house. And this is the house in 19, uh, let me see here, in 19 something, 1958. This is the house today. And whoops, there's a slide missing in there. Okay, but anyhow, this is a house that, there's a, a slide missing, but it shows a house in 1913 with a whole bunch of dormers on it. And this is where this, the, the um, uh, Silvas, for every child that was born, they put a, a dormer on. Mm -hmm. So then when the children all left, they had to re-roof it. So they took the, restructured the roof and took the dormers off. Well, the Fikes, respecting that, put a new dorm. This is a kind of reminder to say, and there was actually a dormer there in the, in the original house. But I'm sorry that that slide doesn't show. Um, now, this house is kind of interesting. This is, again, at the corner of, of uh, Heezer. This, this lady tells a story of when she was a child, 11 years old, in London. She went to the movie Withering Heights. And she came home and she said, Mom, I want to live in a house where the windows reflect the ocean. Mm -hmm. So she's been all over the world. You know, she's one of those. And um, <laughs> so she came here to visit her son. And she saw this house. And the ocean was reflected in the windows. She said, that's mine. And so she restored it, and there was all kinds of stuff going on about that. But anyhow, I thought that was kind of a curious story about this house. So we lost it again. Oh, OK. So here is, this is a picture from Percy Maxwell book. It's of the, um, there was a dairy farm. Heezer had a dairy farm. Um, right in here. And this building is again typical of the barns, the inexpensive barns that they have. So if we go back to, whoops, I'm going in the wrong direction. Give me a preview of the point here. <laughs> we go back to this house. This part of the house is the typical house. You know, 20 by 50, uh, 20 by 25. This is the barn shape. So you have the one kind of house, like the uh, house on the corner of Ford and Covalo that was this sort of beautiful shape. That's one sort of shape. This, um, this barn shape is another sort of house shape. Now, I don't know, but it might very well be that this house and that barn are the same house. This was, um, this first shows up in the Sanborns in 1898. And on that, what I was trying to show you with the Sanborn that didn't read, was that at the bottom of the property, this is a, a big piece of property. I think it's two thirds of the, of the lot. It's on Lake, and uh, Little Lake and Teaser just down. And uh, it shows a series of little buildings down on the bottom of the site. One of the buildings, and, and the other thing that, it, that is not shown, is Ray Rice's house on the Sanborn. One of the little buildings there is the same shape and, again, approximate, the same size and shape as Ray Rice's house. So it could very well have been that the little house that was here was moved up the hill and became Ray Rice's house. Now I don't have the anything. So this house was, this is 1958. And this is the remodeling of it. It was um, 1898 in the, in the, and again, this is 20 by 20, uh, 24 by 25. And this section, this section is 12, 
cross, which is very similar to the house that I, the brown house that was, you know, they had the twin. And again, you have two by sixes, I'll show you later on. But this is a reconstruction of it. And um, this door was there, and there were windows, and there was a door on the back side. But it was built super cheap, which is one of the things that's kind of interesting about all of these. This is the house today from um, Calpella. Uh, the decking is all built, but it's basically the same house. This door is here, there's a door here, there's a door here, whereas the door originally was on the back side, where, which is where you could come in off the street level, as opposed to this door, which you had to come up the stairs. That's the other side. So the salt box, it's kind of the, it's a barn, right? You see these barns all over the place. Now, I don't, I'm not really promoting the idea that it was a, uh, a barn before, but it's built like a barn might have been. So then the, when, when the house got torn apart, this is how they put in the bathroom. They scabbed all of the, this behind here is a bathroom. And, and that was one of the major innovations, of course, in, in, you know, buildings is that you had to have bathrooms. So these older homes had to be modified in order to fit bathrooms in. And so they, they scabbed together. See, this is the original stair, kind of a, see, this is the stair that was there, which was like a ladder. And then this became the bathroom and they put in oak flooring and so on. So there's no rhyme nor reason to the way this was built, other than we've got these materials, they're this long, let's stick them in there. <laughs> then, um, now this is the, the exposed structure. So this is typical of, of, these, of the homes of the era. These are full, this is called balloon framing, where you have a full size two by four. Now the two by fours are one and a half and two and uh, three and th three and a half. But these are full-size two by fours that go 14 feet. The ceiling height is eight feet, so that gives you an additional three or four feet here. Then they build the roof structure using two by sixes and um, full-size, again, one by sixes as, as sheeting for the shingles that are put on. This house had about four sheets, four layers of old wood shingles on it. You're, so, and then they would put a, a TNG, which is a you know, tongue and groove piece of wood that was a one by six here that again provided lateral support. The floor is all one by six. But one of the interesting things about this and is typical of these houses is that the roof slope is 40 degrees. It's very predictable. It was the same slope on the one on uh, the corner of uh, Colo and Lansing. I think, that why they had 40 degrees is it was a lot easier to put the roofing on. If it was 45, you'd slide off pretty easily. That, that five degrees may not make a big difference in our, our view, but when you're putting on shingles and trying to keep your tools next to you, that may be. Yeah. There's also examples of roofs in town. I don't know which house it is or which building it is, where there's a ladder that goes up the roof. Yeah. And there's also a picture of a ladder in here. So then the other curious thing about this, this is after been rebuilt, but the, the flooring is a one by, again, a one by six TNG. These are four by fours. So usually now you would use a two by 12 or a two by eight, two by 10, depending on the span. But these are two by eights. These are two by twelves, full length two by twelves. This four by four. These posts were put in probably in the twenties, little concrete bases. Originally, typically in these old places, that would have been a slice off of a redwood log. Mm -hmm. So they would set that piece on the ground and then build on top of it. Now, the gallery bookstore they talked about when they rebuilt that building, the, the structure the, the posts and such, they were set on whiskey barrels filled with concrete. <laughs> Talk about saving money, huh? Or enjoying your work <laughs> and using the enjoyment. So that's, that's our, my little tour of Mendocino. And I would really like to, uh, to thank the, um, 
the authors of these various books, since I don't want to be accused of plagiarism. <laughs> uh, here's Percy Maxwell's, Pearly Maxwell. Pearly, I'm sorry, Pearly Maxwell's book, How Mendocino Evolved, a wonderful document by uh, some fellow named Chuck Bush. <laughs> <laughs> And then the Misti uh, Mis uh, Mendocino Historical Review has the letters from, um, no, no, this has um, some of the stuff about the Catholic Church and all that kind of stuff, all of the uh, development of that. And this is, this is the one that has the, um, the map of Mendocino from the 19, or 1868, and some of the, the, the letters from, um, then there's the Chinese in Mendocino, which is a very nice book, a wonderful book. And then this is quite a beautiful book. It has some um, watercolors. It was done in uh, 86, I think. But it has some beautiful watercolors. And it shows, and, and the watercolors demonstrate that, you know, when the Forest Service came through in the, in the 60s or so on, they, they planted the trees. The trees weren't here originally, and, and the, the uh, headlands was treeless. Mm -hmm. Except, there's one sort of remnant, it's been cut somehow by lightning or such, of a beautiful redwood tree left in town. And I'll, I'll leave it up to you to find where that tree is. <laughs> so, um, now at, at where we are today is, this is that 1868 map. This is the uh, outline of this map, the yellow, and then this is the Zone A Historic District. And so we have from 72 we have all of these different um, uses of property. And one of the things about um, 1972 and that, that whole, Mendocino was essentially discovered, the people who um, owned this house, the Myers, um, they came up in 1958 and bought the um, Salvador Silva house. They told their friends in Berkeley about it. And about six couples came up. Hanley Myers, uh, the Walkers, uh, uh, a number of other people came up and bought property and became part of the community. Now, Jim Myers was a big part of the community. And uh, he was an accountant, had a place over on, had an office on Main Street. I don't remember exactly the building, but it might have been the um, gallery bookstore. Um, and the Reeves, of course, have been here quite a long time. And so that happened. Then in the 70s or late 60s, the whole hippie thing, there's a book called Mendocino in the 70s. And you know, it, it's wonderful because you, see, you look at the pictures in that book and you say, oh, there's my structural engineer. You know, there's an architect, there's a sing singer, you know, people who enjoyed the counterculture but yet wove themselves back in to the world that, that they had to live in. And I, th and that's, I think that's the, the, the magnificent part about this town is that there's a, uh, a real magic to it. And I was thinking last night that, you know, the original idea was to call it Megsville, which is honor of, in honor of, that, of the guy who sort of found it and all this sort of thing. But how would this the sound the song that the McGarrigal sisters sang? <laughs> Megsville, 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 instead of that sort of rhythmic Mendocino. Well, yes, sir. That's funny. My name is Charles Megs Bush. <laughs> uh, Henry Megs was my relative. He was in San Francisco when he sent a lumber mill and forty guys up here, so they called it Megsville. But a few years later, he left San Francisco owing $800,000. Well, I don't think we want to call it. <laughs> <laughs> well, but it, you know, but the, Men but the whole idea, the sort of rhythm in Mendocino, in the name Mendocino, is really quite wonderful. So, you know, yes, we respect the Meg's <laughs> connection. But Cape Mendocino 
was there since the late 1500s wow, yeah. in honor of Mendoza, and that gets into King Charles of Spain and uh, New yes. Spain and way back in history. Right. But anyhow, that 1587 maps showed um, Cape Mendocino, Cape in honor of Antonio Mendoza. So when Meigsville all of a sudden, hey, no, 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 we're not going <laughs> to call it that. That the only thing north of San Francisco that had been there for hundreds of years was Cape Mendocino, and we just became Mendocino. Fantastic, yeah. yeah. So it wasn't the Bagheera sister's song that caused that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the point being that there were all kinds of people who came, who succeeded, who grown and, and moved on but stayed and, and so it's just uh, kind of as I say it's a it's a, a place with magic. So any questions about this? Why were so many homes moved? Was it because of preservation or what you, you talked about this home was moved, that home was moved to a different site. What was the reason? It was probably cheaper and easier to move something than it was to rebuild. For instance, the, the Headlands Inn, to rebuild that would have been a, a major operation and they just had to kind of move it more or less down the street. End of the day, that wouldn't be a place, a part of town where you wanted to be. Yeah. So you moved because of location and yeah. 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 There were 10 bars along Main Street alone yeah. at that time. Yeah. And, <coughs> and what's the population of Mendocino now? Roughly, roughly a thousand. The census says 800. Yeah. So it was the same as, you know, when he was talking in the 1800s, what the population was. Yeah, but you also have to remember that this was, this was the biggest thing between San Francisco and Eureka. This is where the banks were. This is where the brothels were. This is where the bars were. So all the surrounding towns, Albion and Little River, fed into this town. So it would swell, and, you know, on the, on the weekends when the brothels and the bars were going on. In fact, this is actually one of the saddest days in Mendocino history in my view. This is the day that Mendocino voted local option to become a dry town in 1909. Yeah. <laughs> we should have a moment of silence. <laughs> <laughs> we should all have a drink to that. <laughs> um. uh, most of you know that uh, Carl Watkins was here in 1863 and he took a picture from down on the bluff looking up uh, what is now Lansing Street and there was a little church there the first church uh, built by um, J.B. Ford and uh, William Kelly was the builder of this uh, <coughs> building and uh, it was long before uh, uh, Masonic Temple yeah Masonic Temple and when they built the big church in 1867-68, um, it became part of the schoolhouse. And there had been a schoolhouse right next to it, because we have pictures of that. And they moved the schoolhouse, is my understanding, together with the church building. They took the front uh, section off that held the tower with the bell, and they put that steeple on top of the building. And there's a picture showing uh, Masonic Hall from behind with this building, with this steeple. And I couldn't figure out, you know, what was going on. And I'm convinced um, that the little jewelry store and maybe the one next to it was the original church. Because when uh, the barbershop moved out, and they redid, uh, worked on you know the building. Um, they had to redo the floor, and they took everything up, and it was dirt underneath. You know, it, it had not been touched. You mm -hmm. know, hmm. in all that time, time Fantastic. Like, and what's was lovely about it, I haven't been in it in a long time, but she kept the architectural structure showing. She didn't cover it up with plaster. Mm. But oh, I'm, yeah. uh, you know, the, the pictures, if you look at the sequence of pictures, you can, you know, you get that feeling. So they put a second floor on it, they put all kinds of, uh, you know, the, the, I don't know what the term is when they put a false 
Yeah. 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 Western Front, front. Yeah. yeah. And right. this, this goes to your evolution of, of houses and buildings. Is that building as the, as the first church, as you were saying, uh, J.D. Johnson, man, you were talking about, got the contract in 1898 to turn that into apartments. And he actually left the scaffolding up for 15 years. For 17 <laughs> years. You know why? Why? Don't have to pay the property tax until the remodel's done. One other thing. Peter was doing his thing. <coughs> um, he named all the north south streets like um, um, Lansing and uh, Woodward and uh, all after early pioneers. And the east-west streets were named after other towns in the area. And if you ask why is, why is Little Lake there, Little, uh, what's the name, Willits. Willits, Willits before Mr. Willits, decided we should name the name at the town after me, Mr. Willett, that was Little Lake. Huh. So they were all named after other yeah. all towns. those lake roads. <laughs> yeah. But it's curious that each of those towns, of all the towns that he could select, each of them had a native a connection to Native Americans. You know, that's I think that's one of the th because they were really dependent on the they, they had taken they hadn't taken well I guess they had taken or the Native Americans had used this land pretty extensively at the time. Uh, the Presbyterian Church was originally built right on the ground. They leveled the ground and laid the main 12 by 12 redwood beams out on the ground and built the church up from that. It wasn't jacked up and put on a foundation until 1968. Or 1968, my gosh. Yeah. And it, but it survived the earthquake. It survived the earthquake because it skated on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> a sled, of sorts, yeah. Well, one of the interesting things about in this house is that the in the ceiling, Manuel Silva carved April 1906 in the ceiling, and then he carved May 1906, or no, June 1906. And in May is when the 06 earthquake happened, so it, it you know. So it, it kind of gives a date. Well, thank oh, well, One last thing. When Meggs <coughs> uh, was in San Francisco and hired the, the 40 guys uh, to come up and, and uh, build the lumber mill here, those guys were all from New England. <coughs> and uh, a lot of them became builders afterwards. And guess what kind of houses New England guys <laughs> built. <laughs> they want the snow to slide down. Yeah. And that's why we have all the, and it's much cheaper for Hollywood to come to Mendocino to do an <coughs> Eastern movie <laughs> than it is so. What Megs did really is making all kinds of help for Mendocino right. in this day and age. Yeah. Megs also <laughs> developed Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco, <coughs> as a whole wharf district in San Francisco. Uh, one of the wars was called Meg's Wharf, and there's a picture of the of that wharf in one of the books, history books in San Francisco. That's really quite interesting. Um, so there's a you know we're connect the city the town is connected. There's one other thing if you go and look at the map that's in the uh, parlor over here, um, it shows Mendocino as Meg'sville. Written on it. I mean, That's it a very a early map. Yeah. A very, very early map. Good. Well, I think that wraps it up. Thank yes. you so very much. Again, I just hope maybe all of you will consider becoming a member of the museum if you're not already a member. And coincidentally, the program in August is about your. Uh, point of the hippies when they came and eventually evolved into, you know, blending with the town. Uh, Lisa Spicer will be here talking about the community of Compshi and how it evolved into a homogeneous 
type of, maybe that's the wrong word, but anyway, everybody <laughs> got together eventually. And uh, so that would be August for our, for our talk. Thank you. Thank you once again.